By the end of 50 BC, Gaius Julius Caesar was at a crossroads. His ambitious campaign to subjugate the peoples of Gaul was finally coming to an end, just as his relationship with his rival Pompey and the Senate of Rome was beginning to deteriorate. With the end of his governorship looming, his enemies seemed poised to confiscate both his military command and newfound wealth. It was amongst the backdrop of this escalating conflict that Caesar wrote a series of commentaries on his military campaigns in Gaul, hoping to bypass the Senate and secure popular support for his actions. At some point in this drafting process, he chose to include a survey of the local customs of the regions he had conquered, and it was within this survey that he provided a description of the religious class of Gaul that would become iconic. In describing this class, he deliberately avoided using the term he had used in previous sections for priests. Instead, he used a Gaelic word, Druid or Druidai. This same name was used by authors both before and after Caesar, but it was his account of this class that would endure long past this group's destruction. If we are to believe him, then the Druids comprised the paramount group of Gaelic society, a class of men empowered to judge both religious and civil affairs. To their disciples, they preached the infallibility of the soul, and urged them to honour the gods, to abstain from wrongdoing, and to practice courage. In addition to these practices, Caesar claimed that they held great knowledge of both cosmology and the natural world. Their most sacred duty was the conducting of sacrifices to the gods, sacrifices that often took the form of huge wooden effigies, in which animals and men alike would be trapped and richly burned alive. Both Caesar and later authors would claim that the Romans put a stop to such practices. Even so, the Druids seemed to have found sanctuary overseas, where they would persist for another five centuries, only to fall to the rising tide of Christianity. Even then, their memory would endure. If we believe the claims of revivalists, then their ancient teachings are still practiced to this day, in the form of the great Celtic festivals and modern neo-Druidic groups. In recent decades, both ancient texts and the archaeological record have been increasingly scrutinized to reconstruct a more accurate image, but still, it seems we are far from answering the fundamental question. Who were the Druids? For the last five centuries, the Druids have been a subject of fascination amongst the peoples and scholars of France, Britain and Ireland. In this period, they have been presented in almost every form imaginable. Their earliest portrayals emerged in the 16th century, a time when the nations of Western Europe were rediscovering the classics of the ancient Greeks and Romans. In these accounts, the Druids are presented as honoured ancestors, strain of pre-Roman sophistication amongst their respective peoples. In time, this image would evolve, with less sympathetic authors presenting them as a sign of pre-Christian barbarity, devoted to idol worship and human sacrifice. By the 18th century, this interest had become something of a mania, and soon the image of the Druid would be embellished by all manner of romantic ideals. In this line of thinking, they were portrayed as simple yet noble philosophers, an image that was increasingly mixed up by a strain of what Stuart Piggott termed irrational mysticism. The burgeoning field of archaeology only added to this confusion, with objects that we now know to date from wildly different periods being added to the stereotypical image of the Druids. This image was distorted further by their identification with the great megalithic sites of France and Britain and their association with places such as Stonehenge persist in the popular consciousness to this day. These ideas about the Druids endured well into the modern period, and it was not until the arrival of 20th century archaeology that their stereotypical image was put to rest. 
We now know that sites such as Stonehenge date from many thousands of years before the first accounts of the Druids, and that there is far from definitive archaeological evidence that they existed at all. Even so, their impact on popular culture has remained. Today many thousands of self-described Druids gather to celebrate the solstices at Stonehenge and other monuments across Britain and France, and neo-Druidic organisations only continue to grow in membership across both Europe and North America. So who were the Druids? Did they really exist in Britain and Gaul? And did they resemble the descriptions given to us by authors such as Caesar? If so, what were their teachings? And can we detect any glimpse of their beliefs in more modern Druidic organisations? Well, if we are to try and answer any of these questions, we must examine four major sources of evidence, each of which carries their own set of caveats. The first is the accounts of classical writers dating roughly from the 8th century BC to the end of the 4th century AD. Secondly, we must examine the archaeological record of Iron Age societies across Britain and Gaul and see what they can tell us of native religious practices. Thirdly, we must examine the tales of the Irish mythological cycles. These accounts ostensibly portray a pre-Christian island, where the Druids feature as key players, acting as the magicians and advisors of the pagan kings of Munster, Connacht, Leinster, Ulster and Tara. Finally, we must examine the practices of contemporary groups operating under the title of Druid and examine their claims of continuity with their ancient forerunners. Ahead of us lies a journey through nearly 3,000 years of history, one that begins along the fringes of the Mediterranean, that takes us through the world of Iron Age Britain, Gaul and Ireland, before finally ending in modern Europe and North America. Let us begin. In this video, we'll examine the first two of these sources, both of which pertain to the Iron Age Druids of Britain and Gaul. We'll start by examining the earliest accounts of Western Europe, which come to us from an era when Greek colonies were thriving along the shores of Gaul and Hispania. From there, we'll examine the accounts of the Druids from the era of Roman expansion north of the Alps, through to the time of Roman domination of both Gaul and Britain. Lastly, we'll examine the Christian accounts of the late Roman Empire, by which point the Druids seem to have largely disappeared from their original territories. We'll then move to examine the known archaeological record of the modern constituent countries of Gaul and Britain, and determine whether any correlations can be drawn between known Iron Age religious practices and the writings of contemporary authors. Before we can dive into these accounts, however, we must first mention a handicap that has blighted the attempts of scholars to form a coherent picture of the Druids. You see, prior to their takeover by Rome, the societies of both Iron Age Gaul and Britain were illiterate, and as a result no known native written account has come down to us detailing their religious practices. Moreover, there are good reasons to suspect that there was a prescription amongst the Druids against writing their teachings down. Instead, we are forced to rely on the observations of foreign authors, many of whom are less than complementary in their presentation of Druidic teachings. Even then, our selection is limited. If we tally up all the known references to Druids amongst the peoples of Greece and Rome, we arrive at a total of around 20 accounts, with their authors being dispersed widely across the Mediterranean. Many of these accounts have come down to us as fragments, surviving only as references in the works of authors writing many centuries later. In a few extreme cases, the presence of these earlier authors can only be attested to through passages found in the works of these later writers, whilst in one case, the credited author is likely a false one. In length, these passages are slim. As the historian Ronald Hutton notes in his book, Blood and Mistletoe, the combined text we have available to us on the Druids is perhaps enough to fill a dozen pages, providing they are written in a fairly large print. Yet despite their brevity, the highly summarised nature of many of these accounts still allows them to provide substantial descriptions of supposed druidic activities in Gaul and Britain, along with wider information on the Iron Age societies within each of these regions. These works are characterised by general agreement on the druid's role. 
acting as both a philosophical and religious class in British and Gaulish society. When we stop to examine their fine details, however, we discover an increasing number of contradictions. In some accounts, the Druids are presented as a unified organization that gathered in a single location and that served a single leader. In others, they appear as only the most prominent of several groups of religious functionaries within Gallic society. In order to reconcile the contradictions of these accounts, modern scholars have sought to place them into three broad categories. The first of these are the writings of Greek explorers active in Western Europe during the 3rd and the 4th centuries BC. These accounts are by far the most obscure, existing mostly as excerpts and quotations in the works of later authors. The second school of writers consists of accounts of the Druids beginning with the initial Roman expansion into Gaul, continuing until their apparent disappearance during the 2nd century AD. Of all the classical accounts, these are easily the most expansive, being somewhat contemporary in both time and proximity to the societies of the purported Druids of Gaul and Britain. Finally, we have the least well-examined accounts of the Druids, those of the Christian writers of the cities of Alexandria and Antioch in the 3rd and the 4th centuries AD. We'll examine the accounts of each of these three groups shortly, but first, if we want to understand the political context behind them, we must familiarise ourselves with the political situation of Western Europe during the closing centuries of the first millennium BC. At the end of the 9th century BC, the people of Greece were emerging from a dark age that had lasted some 400 years. This resurgence was marked by the reappearance of developed city-states and the seeding of Greek colonies throughout the Western Mediterranean. By the mid-8th century BC, Greek cities were being established in Italy, Sicily and on the islands of Corsica and Sardinia. Around the beginning of the 6th century BC, further colonies began to appear along the shores of Gaul and Hispania, including the settlements of Massalotes, Impurae, Agatha, Road and Nicala. It is from this era of exploration that the initial accounts of Atlantic Europe emerge. The earliest known of these is the account of Hecateus of Miletus, a 6th century BC Greek writer who compiled one of the earliest known geographical treaties around 500 BC. This work, titled The Journey Around the Earth, is known to us only in fragments. One of these fragments provides the first recorded use of the term Keltoi, or Celts, to describe a group of people living near the Greek colony of Massalotes in southern Gaul. This account is further echoed by a late 5th century BC writer, Herodotus. In his text, The Histories, he provides a similar description of the western reaches of the Mediterranean, claiming that the Celts were amongst the westernmost peoples of Europe, and that they dwelled beyond the Pillars of Hercules, now known as the Straits of Gibraltar. Whilst these accounts give us our first glimpse at the peoples of Western Europe, they contain no substantial descriptions of these societies, and no information can be gleaned from them regarding the presence of any religious elite. To the best of our knowledge, it would take another century for such an account to emerge. This work, a treatise known as On the Hyperboreans, was penned around the end of the 4th century BC, by a scholar also named Hecateus, this time hailing from the city of Abdera in Thrace. Whilst this account is also lost, an excerpt from it can still be found in the work of the 1st century BC Greek author Theodorus of Sicily. In this fragment, Hecateus details an island supposedly found beyond the lands of the Celts, inhabited by a people known as the Hyperboreans. This island, which he claimed lay beyond the point where the north wind blows, was said to have had a temperate climate, and to be home to a spherical temple to a god Hecateus equated with the Greek deity Apollo. He goes on to describe this temple as being adorned with a large number of votive offerings, and states that the locals would worship their god with the recital of praise hymns and lyre playing. The inhabitants of Hyperborea are further said to operate on a 19-year cycle. <laughs> 
supposedly based on the period it took for the stars to return to the same place in the heavens. The end of this period would be marked by the appearance of their god within his temple, an event that they would celebrate with more lyre playing and ritual dancing. This fragment marks the first mention of any form of priesthood or temple attributed to Atlantic Europe, along with any description of celestial worship. Intriguing as this account is, the exact location it refers to cannot be determined from the text, and as we will soon discuss, there are good reasons to doubt its accuracy. For a more certain reference to religious practices amongst these peoples, we must turn instead to the accounts of three other authors. The first is that of the 4th century BC philosopher Sopater, whose work survives as a fragment in the account of the late 2nd century AD author Athenaeus. In his account, Sopater relates that it is the custom of the Celts to sacrifice prisoners captured in battle to their gods, implying that this takes the form of ritual burning. The second account is that of the early 3rd century BC author Timaeus. In an excerpt from his lost works related to us by Diodorus, he states that the Celtic peoples living on the shores of the Mediterranean venerated the twin gods known as the Discori, and held the ancient tradition that these gods came to them from the ocean. Our third account is that of the otherwise obscure Eudocius of Rhodes in the late 3rd century BC, who states that the Gauls would respond to invasions of their land by swarms of locusts, by offering prayers and sacrifices, which would in turn attract flocks of birds to destroy the locusts. Eudocius also tells us that the punishment for any man who captured one of these birds had to be death or else the birds would not respond if called upon once again. As intriguing as these accounts of ritual practices are, they do not contain any direct mention of the Druids. Instead, we must turn to two later texts, both of which unambiguously refer to the Druids as a religious class amongst the peoples of Western Europe. As with many others, the original accounts have been lost, existing only as two brief references in the work of the later Greek author Diogenes Laretus. In his life of eminent philosophers, he refers briefly to the work of the 2nd century BC Greek author Sotion of Alexandria, along with a book of magic that at the time was widely attributed to Aristotle. Here our first mention of the Druids can be found, with them being described simply as the holy men and the philosophers of the Celts featuring alongside those of the Persians, the Babylonians, and the Indians. Compared with these other groups, their references are slim, but we do have one important passage that gives us our first glimpse at their teachings. Quote, As to the gymnosophists and druids, we are told that they uttered their philosophy in riddles, bidding men to reverence the gods, to abstain from wrongdoing, and to practice courage. Finally, we have an account by an obscure 2nd century BC poet, Nicander of Colophon, preserved in a later work by the 3rd century AD author Tertullian. This poet alludes to religious practices amongst the Celts, who he claims would commune with the dead to predict the future. In order to achieve this, they would spend all night alongside the graves of the deceased, hoping to gain enlightenment from their dreams. So what can we learn from this handful of references? In Hecateus of Abdera's account, it is tempting to say that we have an early glimpse of religious practices in Atlantic Europe, one that involved both solar and lunar worship, along with the deposit of votive offerings. This line of thinking has proven a popular one ever since interest in the Druids was first rekindled. John Toland, an early antiquarian of the 17th century, attempted to equate the temple in this account with the stone circle of Kalanish on the western coast of Lewis Island in the Outer Hebrides. More recently, the archaeologist Audrey Burl has attempted to equate the 19-year cycle of the Hyperboreans with the 18.6-year cycle of lunar standstills observed in the north, an argument mirrored by fellow archaeologist Barry Cunliffe. Cunliffe has further theorised that this account of the Hyperboreans was taken from the work of the 4th century BC explorer Bipheus, whose work would have been contemporary to Hecateus of Abdera. To back up this theory, he points to measures of latitude preserved by the later astronomer Hipparchus of Nicaea, 
who quotes sun measurements made by Pythias as his source. One of these reported measures is 58 degrees 13 minutes, a latitude that does indeed cross Lewis Island. This theory is certainly an interesting one, but it should be noted that there are significant concerns with the accuracy of the account it draws upon. The most egregious of these is that the claimed location of Hyperborea varies wildly between different ancient authors, with successive authors placing its location further and further north as understanding of European geography improved. In the pseudo-historical accounts of Hesiod and Homer, Hyperborea is located north of Thrace in areas of what are now Romania and Bulgaria. Hecateus of Miletus also places it along the coast of the Black Sea, an area whose geography was more widely understood by the time Hecateus of Abdera relocated the Hyperboreans to an island off the coast of Gaul. By the time of the 2nd century AD author Ptolemy, who composed his maps when accounts of Britain were more widely known, the location of the Hyperboreans had changed again, this time to a location in the North Sea above Ireland. This repeated change in location has led many authors to consider the Hyperboreans more mythical than historical. This otherworldliness is even hinted at by the 5th century BC Greek poet Pindar in the following lines of his Pythian ode. Quote, of the fairest glories that mortals may attain, to him is given to sail to the furthest bound. Yet neither ship nor marching feet may find the wondrous way to the gatherings of the Hyperborean people. It should also be noted that the main author to preserve Hecateus's account is Diodorus of Sicily, who also provided separate descriptions of the peoples of Britain in his Bibliotheca Historica. These descriptions, which likely originate with Pythias himself, contain no mention of the Hyperboreans, and employ a distinctly separate set of terminology. Based on these arguments, it seems unlikely that Hecateus's passages on the Hyperboreans originate from Pythias, though it remains possible that he did indeed visit Lewis Island. So putting aside this account, what can we glean about the Druids from these remaining authors? Well, we can be reasonably certain that a group of Gaelic holy men with this title was known of in the areas around the Greek colonies of southern Gaul from the 2nd century BC. The majority of these accounts present this group in either a neutral or a positive light, equating them in passing with the respected philosophers of other cultures. From Eudocius, we learn that the communities they belonged to used animal sacrifices as a way of invoking the natural world a practice similar to that of the Greeks and Romans of this period. Already we see the equation of local gods with those of the Greek pantheon, specifically the divine twins of Castor and Pollux. We also see hints at a darker element of religious worship, in Sopater's account of ritual sacrifice by the Celts of their defeated foes. However, his account of human sacrifices never directly references the Druids, and so Peter's account is limited to discussing actions committed during warfare. For the moment, then, we are still unable to directly connect the Druids and these ritual sacrifices. In order to form a more complete view of the Druids' role within society, we must now turn to the accounts of later Roman and Greek authors, who provide descriptions of native religious practices on the cusp of Roman involvement in Western Europe. By the midpoint of the 2nd century BC, the rivalry between the Western Mediterranean powers of Carthage and Rome was reaching its climax. Since the midpoint of the 3rd century BC, the two had been locked in an escalating cycle of political and military conflicts, including two major wars over their respective territories in Sicily, Corsica and Sardinia. The second of these Punic Wars would end in 201 BC with a decisive victory by Rome, after which Carthage was forced to give up its European territories. As a result of this victory, Rome found itself in possession of vast swathes of eastern and southern Iberia, much of which had until recently been controlled by its indigenous people. Over the next 80 years, Rome would struggle to subjugate this territory, and soon a new overland trade route formed across southern Gaul 
to allow both armies and goods to reach Iberia. These trade caravans would quickly prove a tempting target for the local Ligurian tribes, and after repeated raids throughout the first half of the 2nd century BC, a Ligurian group by the name of the Saluvi began to pose a serious threat to the Roman allied city of Massalotes. In 125 BC, repeated appeals for aid from the Massaliots led to a Roman military intervention in the region. Two years later, a Roman army led by General Quintus Opimus destroyed the Saluvian capital at Entremont, and over the following years, Roman armies would penetrate deep into Gaul. The decisive victory came in 121 BC, when a Roman army inflicted a crushing defeat on a combined Gaelic force led by the Arverni and the Allobroges. This victory ended any immediate threat to Roman trade routes, and brought the lands of the Ligurians and the Allobroges under Roman control. In the process, Rome also received a small strip of coastal land from Massalotes, on which they constructed a road named the Via Domitia to link Italy and Hispania. Over the next few decades, this collective territory came to form the new Roman province of Transalpine Gaul, putting Roman citizens in direct contact with its native peoples. It was amongst this backdrop of increasing Roman control that a Syrian-born philosopher by the name of Posidonius made a journey throughout southern Gaul. Considered the leading polymath of his day, Poseidonius was a highly acclaimed Stoic philosopher, who also compiled a vast number of works on subjects such as geography, mathematics, history, physics and astronomy. After taking up residence in Rhodes around the beginning of the 1st century BC, he made a series of journeys around the Roman world, one of which included travel through the developing province of Transalpina. After returning to Rhodes, he wrote a full geographic and cultural treatise on the peoples of these regions, one that is unfortunately lost. Luckily for modern scholars, however, Poseidonius's preeminence as an author meant that many later Roman writers quoted his work in their own histories, both with and without credit. This was the case with both Strabo and Diodorus of Sicily, and it is also likely that sections of Caesar's account were inspired by Poseidonius. For this reason, scholars sometimes refer to these three authors as belonging to the Poseidonian school of discussion on the Druids. On one hand, these authors portray the Druids as the undisputed religious elite of the peoples of Gaul and Britain, as the holders of a vast body of teachings on cosmology and herbal medicine, and as the judges of Gaelic society. Conversely, they are also presented in line with Sopater's account as the overseers of human sacrifice a practice that contemporary Roman society would have considered barbaric. We will examine what survives of Poseidonius' writings in due course, but first, let us start with the most authoritative account of the Druids to survive from this group of authors, that of Julius Caesar. Writing fifty years after Poseidonius, the Gaul that Caesar would have been familiar with was one radically changed from only half a century earlier. In that time, concern had only risen within Roman society regarding the Gallic terror, the encroaching threat of northern Gallic tribes on Italy. These fears were further exacerbated by the migration of new groups of Germanic peoples through Gaul, including the Cimbri, the Ambrones and the Teutones, each of which would launch raids on Roman territory during the last decade of the 2nd century BC. These invaders were eventually defeated in 101 BC, when Roman forces led by Caesar's uncle Gaius Marius all but wiped out the Teutones and the Cimbri. Despite these victories, the independent peoples of northern Gaul remained a source of anxiety for the Roman world, one that Caesar would exploit in launching his conquest of the region from 58 BC onwards. It is at the conclusion of this campaign, some eight years later, that he wrote and published an account of his time in Gaul. In addition to the straightforward description of his military exploits, Caesar included descriptions of Gallic society in which the Druids were portrayed prominently. If we follow his account, then the Druids were one of two elite groups within Gallic society, with the other being referred to as either the Knights or the Warriors. Here their duties included religious matters, private sacrifices and divination, as well as acting as the judges of any crimes or disputes. 
In times of war, these druids were also exempt from combat or taxation, and it was this exemption that guaranteed them many students. According to Caesar, it took 20 years of teaching to become a druid, and many who sought their instruction would travel to Britain in the course of their teachings, as it is here that he claims druidic thought originated. Of their religious beliefs, he writes that the druid's cardinal teaching was that the soul did not perish upon death, but instead passed to another body, a teaching that aided them in encouraging fearlessness amongst their warriors. Caesar also writes that their disciples were educated on an extensive range of topics, including astronomy, the order of the natural world, and the power of the immortal gods. However, they also placed a prescription on writing down these teachings, firstly to prevent transition of their secrets, and second to improve their skills of memorization. Most interestingly, he also describes the Druids of Gaul as serving a single leader, who was elected by his fellows, though his position could also be claimed by armed conflict if the succession was contested. Caesar goes on to state that the Druids would gather annually in the lands of the Carnutes, where they would pronounce judgment on disputes gathered from the whole of Gaul. It is at this point that a darker element begins to creep into Caesar's account. After giving a brief overview of the role of the knights within Gallic society, he suddenly shifts into a description of human sacrifices amongst the Gauls, at which he states the Druids acted as the chief ministers. Here we can find perhaps the most iconic descriptions of Druidic practices. After stating that Gauls afflicted with illnesses, or facing battle would conduct human sacrifices to avoid angering the gods, he elaborates that in some places these sacrifices were conducted by building enormous wooden figures, which would then be filled with sacrificial victims and set alight. Often the victims consigned to these wicker men consisted of thieves or other criminals, but innocents were sometimes used if the supply of the condemned ran low. Caesar finishes by outlining the Gallic pantheon, one that he equates directly to specific Roman gods. If we are to believe him, then the chief Gallic deity was Mercury, who was said to be the inventor of all arts, the patron of travellers, and the god of money and trade. In addition, he also lists Apollo, Mars, Jupiter, and Minerva as being revered amongst the Gauls, with them placing special reverence on Mars, the god of war. He relates that prior to going into battle, the Gauls would dedicate the spoils to Mars, and in the event of a victory, they would sacrifice any captives in his honour, then deposit the spoils in a sacred location. Caesar concludes by stating that the Druids taught that the Gauls were descended from the god of the underworld, and that as such they would measure time by the passing of nights rather than days. It is tempting to accept Caesar's account as verbatim, given the extent of his first-hand knowledge of Gaul and Britain, and indeed we must concede that much of his description of Gallic society is likely to be accurate. There are good reasons, however, to doubt at least some elements of his description. For example, there are contradictory details to be found in Caesar's account, such as his claim that the powers of the Druids were enhanced in emergencies, but that they also held aloof from war. Indeed, this second claim clashes with a contemporary Roman account, which dates from roughly a decade prior. It can be found in the writings of Cicero, a prominent Roman statesman and political rival of Caesar, who would later be executed on the instruction of his successors, Mark Anthony and Octavian. In a passage of his work on divination, he informs us that he can attest to the presence of such practices amongst the Druids, having met one himself in Rome. This druid, who was known as Divisiacus, is described as using augury, a practice wherein the movement of birds was interpreted to predict the future, along with all other forms of natural phenomena. This same Divisiacus would appear in Caesar's account, this time listed not as a druid, but as a leading aristocrat and ally of Rome. If this is correct, then Cicero's account jars with Caesar's description of the druids as a class that held aloof from warfare and suggests a degree of crossover between their duties and those of the resident nobility. It should be noted, though, that Cicero's writings match other details of Caesar's account, 
such as the presence of human sacrifice amongst the Gauls. Finally, we should also remember that Caesar was a highly ambitious individual, one who would have known only too well how to play to his Roman audience. The picture he paints of the peoples he successfully subjugated, including those of Gaul and coastal Britain, is often that of a near-civilised people, containing elements familiar to Roman society, such as an organised priesthood and noble class. Roman deities are presented as familiar to the people of Gaul, as was the conducting of proper animal sacrifice, an important element of Roman religion. But in the case of peoples that remain beyond his rule, he instead portrays society far beyond the normality of Roman society. The best example of this is with the people of Germany, with whom he was involved in military conflicts along the border of Belgic Gaul. Here he lists his opponents as unrestrained barbarians, unfamiliar with the Roman gods or proper forms of worship, and lacking the druids of their western neighbours. He even portrays them as being ignorant of agriculture, a claim he extends to the people of the interior of Britain, and one that is known from the archaeological record to be false. As a result, it has been suggested by a number of modern scholars, such as Sean Dunham, Bernard Mayer, and Ronald Hutton, that these distortions are a deliberate tactic on Caesar's behalf. By portraying Gallic society as at least semi-civilised, with a resident set of priests and organised nobility, he was able to justify the inclusion of its people into an enlarged Roman Republic. Conversely, by portraying the Germans and the British as ungovernable savages, Caesar draws a useful line between them and the peoples he had been able to subjugate, one that provides ample explanation for his failure to extend Roman rule to these regions. This tendency for manipulation was indeed well known to Caesar's contemporaries, including the historian Gaius Asinius Pollio, who stated that Caesar was too quick to believe others' accounts of their actions, and to give a false account of his own actions, either on purpose or through forgetfulness. Moving beyond Caesar's account, we must jump forward a few decades to find our next mention of the Druids. In this time, the structure of the Roman world had changed dramatically. In the wake of Caesar's assassination in 44 BC, an alliance had emerged between his political heir, Octavian, and the Roman generals Mark Anthony and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. This alliance, dubbed the Second Triumvirate, would govern the Roman state until 33 BC, when relations between Octavian and Anthony broke down. The resulting war ended with Octavian's decisive victory at the Battle of Actium, after which Anthony committed suicide. Now the undisputed master of the Roman world, Octavian would formalise his position through the acquisition of ever greater senatorial powers, whilst keeping the outer facade of the Republic intact. In 27 BC, he and the Senate formulated what would be known as the First Settlement, bestowing upon Octavian the title of Augustus, the illustrious one, along with the title by which he and his regime would come to be known. Princeps, the first citizen. For all intents and purposes, the Roman Empire had begun. It is amongst the backdrop of this shift from Republic to Empire that our next accounts of the Druids emerge, those of the Greek authors Strabo and Diodorus of Sicily. Both men resided in parts of the Mediterranean under Roman control, and their accounts are clearly influenced by that of Caesar before them. Whilst they agree with the general picture painted by Caesar of the Druids, they also introduce a number of contradictory details. It has been suggested that these new details originate from Poseidonius, who Strabo references in his account, though not in passages related to the Druids. Of the two, it is Diodorus that provides the most in-depth description of the Druids' religious practices in his Bibliotheca Historica. He begins by echoing Caesar, describing votive deposits of gold made by the Gauls to honour their gods. He then adds a detail not mentioned by Caesar, stating that the Gallic teaching that souls pass to another body upon death is derived from that of Pythagoras, a Greek philosopher that founded a school in southern Italy sometime in the late 6th century BC. 
So much did this belief prevail amongst the Gauls, that according to Diodorus, they would cast letters onto the pyres of their deceased kinsmen, so that the dead would be able to read these letters. This identification of Druidic teachings with that of Pythagoras has posed difficulties for modern scholars. Almost all contemporary accounts of his life and teachings are now lost, and what accounts do remain are largely satirical in nature. Both Xenophanes and Heraclitus, writing in the early 5th century BC, mock Pythagoras for believing in reincarnation, with Xenophanes relating that Pythagoras once intervened to prevent a dog from being beaten, as he believed he had heard the voice of a deceased friend in its howls. A brief mention of Pythagoras is repeated half a century later by Herodotus, who again mentions him in relation to Thracian beliefs on immortality. By the time of Diodorus, however, his school had become associated with a wide range of teachings on lifestyle, mathematics and metaphysics, many of which are now known to be contradictory. One consistent thread of thought associated with Pythagoras, however, is the belief in transmutation, the idea that upon death, a person's soul would be reborn in a new body. This idea would have been considered a highly unusual one amongst mainstream Greek and Roman thought, amongst which it was commonly held that the dead departed to the underworld. Diodorus's resulting equation of Pythagorean teachings with those of the Druids is likely due to it being the most recognisable example of teachings on immortality in the Roman and Greek world of the period rather than there being any genuine link between the peoples of Gaul and Pythagoras' teachings. Moving on from Pythagoras, Diodorus adds another detail also not found in Caesar's account, stating that the Gauls would preserve the heads of their most distinguished enemies in cedar oil for display. This account is also found in Strabo's work, The Geographia, where he states Poseidonius as having observed the practice firsthand to his evident disgust. Both authors relate this headhunting activity as part of the boastful nature of Gallic society, a trait that would have been considered a sign of pomposity and barbarism to the Mediterranean world. Diodorus then goes on to contradict Caesar by detailing the presence of three separate groups within Gallic society. This threefold division, which omits Caesar's knights completely, is also described by Strabo, who summarizes these accounts as the bards, the vates, and the Druids. Whilst the bards are described as the poets and singers of Gallic society, it is the division between the Vates and the Druids that is the most interesting. In Caesar's account, the Druids are presented as the conductors of proper sacrifice, with Caesar claiming that they were also responsible for divination. Here they are instead consigned by Strabo to the role of philosophers, with the responsibility of conducting and interpreting sacrifices now being the chief responsibility of the Vates. However, some overlap between these two roles is hinted at by both authors, who state that no proper sacrifice could be conducted without a philosopher present. It also seems that the Druids retained their importance during warfare, as both authors claim that they had the power to prevent any conflict, going as far as to step between two armies as they approached for battle. Finally, both Diodorus and Strabo agree with Caesar on the existence of human sacrifice amongst the Druids, though they also introduce new ways in which the Gauls supposedly disposed of their victims. In addition to the wooden effigies described by Caesar, both outline a process wherein captives and convicted criminals would be executed by being impaled on long poles within their temples, followed once more by ritual burning. In addition to these methods, both authors state that diviners would plunge a dagger or a sword into the body of a victim, then attempt to predict the future through their death motions and through the pooling of their blood. Whilst these accounts broadly agree with Caesar on the nature of the Druids, we can already see contradictions emerging. In addition to the threefold separation of Gallic society described by Diodorus and Strabo, neither account refers to the goal-wide organisation of Druids described by Caesar, nor do they refer to them as serving a single leader or attending an annual gathering to resolve disputes. Similarly, neither author refers to Druids as being active in Britain 
despite Caesar's claim of their practices and instruction originating from them. We therefore have two possibilities in how we consider these accounts, either that the organisation of the religious elite of Gaul had changed remarkably in the years between their accounts, or that the depiction presented by one or more of these authors is incorrect. On the first point, it is not unreasonable to assume that religious worship in Gaul would have changed after decades of Roman rule, with Roman religious structures being increasingly imposed on native religious structures. This can perhaps be best seen in the first appearance of the Vates, or the Seers, within both Strabo and Diodorus's accounts. In their description, this group combines elements of two known Roman groups. The first of these are the aforementioned augurs, who would interpret the will of the gods by examining the flight and cries of birds. The second of these groups was the Harrowspects, who would perform the same interpretation but by using the entrails of sacrificed sheep, with particular focus being placed on the appearance of the liver. It is possible, then, that a hybrid class of the two was now emerging amongst the Druids, as Roman ideas were gradually imposed onto the Gallic belief system. Conversely, it is equally possible that such practices were common within Gallic society long before the arrival of Rome, as shown by Cicero's earlier attribution of augury to the Druid Divisiacus. It is equally possible that this dichotomy was a simple case of confusion by foreign authors, as the term Vates was widely used in ancient Rome as a generic term meaning prophet or poet. Finally, it should be kept in mind that both Diodorus and Strabo were almost certainly working from the writings of Poseidonius. As such, any information gleaned from them may well be referring to the societies he encountered during the initial Roman settlement of Transalpina, rather than to the societies Caesar encountered during his conquest of northern Gaul. As a result, this division between the Bards, the Vates and the Druids may well predate Caesar's account, and might have disappeared by the time of his conquests, or may simply never have been present outside of southern Gaul. Moving on from these three authors, we find our next reference to the Druids in the writings of the geographer Pomponius Mela, who provides a brief description of the Druids in his work, the De Situ Orbis Libri. Whilst his account is mostly a repeat of information provided by Caesar, he relates for the first time a new element of Druidic instruction. Quote, they teach the most noble of the nation many things privately, and for a long time even for twenty years, in a cave or in accessible woods. This association of the Druids with wooded places becomes increasingly common amongst authors of the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. In his epic poem, The Pharsalia, the Roman poet Lucan again associates the Druids with wooded groves, whilst also providing the first recognisably Gallic names for gods worshipped by the Druids. Quote, Cruel Teutates pleased by dreadful blood, Horidesus with his barbaric altars, and Tyrannus more cruel than Scythian Diana. O Druids, now that the war is over, you return to your barbaric rites and sinister ways. You alone know the ways of the gods and powers of heaven, or perhaps you don't know at all. You who dwell in dark and remote forest groves, you say that the dead do not seek the silent realm of Erebus, or the pale kingdom of Pluto, but that the same soul lives again in another world, and death, if your songs are true, is but the middle of a long life. In addition to his passages on Druids, he also provides a description of a forest grove encountered by Caesar during his siege of the Greek city of Massalotes during his war with Pompey. Quote, there stood a grove which from the earliest time no hand of man had dared to violate. Hidden from the sun, its chill recesses, matted boughs entwined, prisoned the air within. No sylvan nymphs here found a home, nor pan, but savage rites and barbarous worship, altars horrible on massive stones upreared. Sacred with blood of men was every tree. If faith be given to ancient myth, no fowl has ever dared to rest upon those branches. <laughs> 
and no beast has made his lair beneath. No tempest falls, nor lightnings flash upon it from the cloud. Stagnant the air unmoving, yet the leaves filled with mysterious trembling, drip the streams from coal-black fountains. Effigies of gods rude, scarcely fashioned from some fallen trunk, held the mid-space, and powered with decay, their rotting shapes struck terror. Thus do men dread most the god unknown. It is the next author, however, that provides the most enduring association with forests and plants, and who also provides much of the iconic imagery associated with the druids today. It belongs to Pliny the Elder, who provides a detailed description of druidic herbology and medical practices in his book on natural history. In it he outlines a ritual practiced by the druids for the harvesting of mistletoe from oak trees, which he asserts were held in a special reverence by the Gauls. Here he claims that the druids would only harvest this sacred plant on the sixth day of the moon's cycle, and that its collection was marked by the holding of sacred meals and the sacrifice of two white bulls. It is also here that we see the first mention of the iconic white robes and golden sickle that would so shape modern depictions of the druids. These items are mentioned only in passing, comprising the ritual attire and implements of the druid trusted with harvesting the mistletoe. Pliny then goes on to claim that the druids would use this plant to create a special drink, asserting in mocking fashion that they believed it would cure infertility in livestock. The same white robes make one more appearance, as the attire worn during the harvesting of another plant, Salago, which is described as only being gathered using a person's right hand, which must first be passed through the robe's left sleeve, as if the plant was being stolen. According to Pliny, the druids held that Salago could be used to ward off all dangers, and that its smoke could be used for the treatment of eye disease. Pliny's account stands out perhaps more than any other amongst these Roman authors. Unlike Caesar, Strabo, or Diodorus, it is not concerned with wider Gallic society, nor does it mention the Vates or the Bards. So unique is its description of Druidic practices that we can only guess as to its source. Perhaps due to its unusual nature and the authority of its author, it ranks alongside that of Caesar as the account of the Druids most commonly presented. Its influence is seen most keenly in 18th and 19th century depictions of the Druid, few of which could be found without either the white robes, golden sickle, or mistletoe. Then, just as suddenly as these items appear, they disappear once more, going unmentioned in the accounts of any other author. Even stranger is the next section of Pliny's account. After wrapping up his description of druidic practices by describing their use of the marsh plant Somolus to treat cattle diseases, he quickly moves to a description of a peculiar object held in veneration by the Gauls. Quote, in the summer months, a vast number of snakes will gather themselves together in a ball, which is held together by their saliva and a secretion from their bodies. The druids say they produce this egg-like object called an anguinum, which the hissing snakes throw up into the air. It must be caught, so they say, in a cloak before it hits the ground. Pliny goes on to state that this object could only be gathered during a specific phase of the moon, and even claims to have seen one of these eggs himself, which he describes as a small apple-sized ball with a hard surface full of indentations. If we are to believe his account, these objects were held in veneration by the Druids, who claimed it would aid in lawsuits and in gaining the goodwill of a leader. Pliny goes on to mock this assertion by relating the account of a man of the Gaulish Viconti tribe, who hid one in his cloak during his trial before the Roman Emperor Claudius, only to be executed when it was discovered. No other author mentions these eggs, leaving us at a loss as to Pliny's source. In addition to these associations with woodland and remote places, the accounts of 1st and 2nd century AD authors are also marked by an increased hostility towards the Druids. It is in these accounts that we see details of repressive measures being brought against their order by the Romans. Both Pliny and Lucan provide denouncements of Druidic practices in their respective works, 
with Pliny stating that their barbaric rites were found within Gaul even during his lifetime. He goes on to say that the continuing existence of these led the Roman emperor of the time, Tiberius, to pass a decree outlawing the Druids, along with what is termed these types of diviners and physicians. He closes by stating the following, quote, But at least we can be glad that the Romans have wiped out the murderous cults of the Druids, who fought human sacrifice and ritual cannibalism with the greatest kind of piety. This outlawing is corroborated in the work of the early 2nd century AD author, Suetonius. In his biographies of the first 12 Roman emperors, he claims that membership amongst the Druids had initially been forbidden to Roman citizens by the Emperor Augustus, though in direct contradiction of Pliny, he places the final responsibility for their destruction on the Emperor Claudius, who he claims destroyed the horrible and inhuman religion of the Gaulish Druids. Between them, these lesser authors paint a picture of an organisation in terminal decline. From Meller and Lucan, we first hear of the association of Druidic practices with remote locations on the edge of society, such as caves and hidden groves. If we believe Pliny and Suetonius, then by the early 2nd century, the Druidic order had been firmly rooted out by the Roman authorities, and may well have ceased to exist entirely. But there are uncertainties about the claims given in these works. For example, both Pliny and Suetonius write as if the Druids had been destroyed, yet Pliny also writes as if many of the rituals he describes were still in common use. It should also be noted that neither of these authors are considered wholly reliable sources. In the case of Pliny, it is widely agreed that he provides accurate information in much of his account of the Mediterranean world but when it comes to more distant regions, his reports often descend into fantasy. When discussing the peoples of Africa, he reports such things as cyclops and men with the heads of dogs. In India, he reports the existence of a one-legged people known as the Monokoli, who he describes as using their single enlarged foot as a sunshade whilst lying on their backs. He further reports known falsehoods within his own society, claiming that the smell of a lamp being put out could induce miscarriage in women, and provides all manner of misinformation as to the dangers of menstrual blood. Considering this, it is hard to say whether his account of the Druids is based in reality, or if it is just another piece of hearsay mistakenly presented as fact. Suetonius himself is also considered far from a reliable source, and was known for both inserting gossip into his account and for presenting his own opinions as objective fact. There are similarly good reasons to be dubious of Lucan's account. To many authors, his inclusion of recognisable names of Gaelic deities lends a level of credibility to his writings on the Druids, but his account of the sacred grove encountered by Caesar's men is considered more suspect. Whilst his account does appear to corroborate earlier accounts of human sacrifice being practised amongst the peoples of Gaul, it should be kept in mind that this grove was more likely a Greek holy place than a Druidic one, being located in a part of Gaul that had been under Greek or Roman rule for the last five centuries. Moreover, Lucan never directly names the Druids in connection with this grove, leaving his intentions unclear. Despite these uncertainties, it remains likely that native religious practices had largely been repressed within Gallic society by the beginning of the second century AD. By this time Gaul had been under Roman control for over 150 years, and any resistance to their practices would likely have become limited to isolated pockets. Indeed, there is little evidence of Druidic involvement in later Gallic rebellions against Roman rule. Perhaps the most telling sign of their decline is that after Suetonius we have only one substantial Roman account of Druidic activity remaining, and it is chiefly concerned with their activities in Britain. After the conquest of Gaul by the Romans in the mid-first century BC, Britain had remained independent for another century. Throughout this period, its southern tribes had slowly become more and more Romanized, both through a steady trade with their continental neighbours and through the exchange and return of British hostages. In 40 AD, the Roman Emperor Caligula had supposedly failed in an attempt to invade Britain 
though primary sources disagree as to exactly how this failure occurred. Instead, it was left to his successor Claudius to complete this conquest, which took place in roughly two phases. The first came between 43 and 60 BC, which saw the conquest of much of southern England. After a decade lull, a second set of conquests took place between 70 and 80 BC, and saw the subjugation of Wales, northern England, and southern areas of Scotland. It is at the end of this first phase that our remaining account of Druids is set. It belongs to the author Tacitus, who compiled several works on Roman history between the late 2nd century and the early 1st century AD. In his Annals, he provides a description of the invasion of the Welsh island of Anglesey by the Roman general Suetonius Paulinus in 60 BC. Here he describes a native army as being accompanied by Druids, along with a horde of black-clad women. Far from holding aloof from warfare, these druids seem to have actively participated in the defence of the island, supporting their warriors with all manner of incantations. Quote, All around, the druids, lifting up their hands to heaven and pouring forth dreadful imprecations, scared our soldiers by the unfamiliar sight, so that, as if their limbs were paralysed, they stood motionless and exposed to wounds. According to Tacitus, the Romans rallied from their initial fear to inflict a crushing defeat on the British, many of whom were taken captive. With their enemies overwhelmed, he tells us that the Romans proceeded to destroy the island's sacred groves, along with native altars he claims were stained with human blood and entrails. Unfortunately for the Romans, this conquest was not to be. According to Tacitus, the same year was marked by a major uprising amongst the British, led by the Queen of the Iceni, Boudicca. This rebellion forced the Romans to withdraw from Anglesey, and the island would remain unconquered for the better part of two decades. Finally, in 77 BC, the conquest would be completed by forces under the command of General Gaius Julius Agricola, who had himself served under Suetonius Paulinus at the time of the first invasion. On the face of it, Tacitus' description of Druidic involvement at Anglesey carries a great deal of authority. In the same year as the Second Conquest, he had married Agricola's daughter, Julia. As such, it is likely that he draws upon the first-hand experiences of participants in the description of the Druidic groves at Anglesey, if not those of Agricola himself. However, there are still reasons to be cautious about his claims. For example, the written version of this account didn't appear until several decades after the events in question, and we have no way of knowing whether its events were embellished by these witnesses in later life. We should also beware of embellishment by Tacitus himself. Whilst the Druids feature prominently in his description of the first invasion of Anglesey in the Annals, they are completely absent from the account of this invasion given in his earlier biography of Agricola. There are also no references to the Druids to be found in his description of the second invasion of Anglesey, nor are they to be found in his description of Agricola's invasion of northern England and Scotland between 80 to 84 BC. We can also point to a contemporary account of this invasion, that of Cassius Dio, who makes no mention of the Druids being present on Anglesey. In addition, whilst his account is commonly used as evidence that Anglesey was a Druidic stronghold, Tacitus never claims such in his account, instead listing it as a population centre and a haven for British refugees. Despite this, we can still infer that Anglesey may have held some significance for the Druids, given Tacitus's description of the sacred groves on the island. There is also one other reference to the Druids to be found amongst Tacitus's writings. In his histories, he relates to us that a fire on the Roman capital during the reign of the Emperor Vespasian was seen as an omen by the Druids of Gaul, one that foretold the Roman Empire's imminent destruction. This statement runs contrary to Pliny and Suetonius' statements that the Druids had been annihilated completely in Gaul at this time, though it should be noted that the year it refers to, 70 AD, narrowly predates both of their accounts. As we move on from Tacitus, 
we find ourselves with only a handful of remaining references to the Druids amongst the authors of the Roman period. Indeed, we receive no further window into Druidic activities in Britain, though we can presume that Roman prohibitions extended their newest province. Instead, our remaining references come to us from Gaul, with three of them being found in the same body of work, the Historia Augusta. This text, which likely dates from the 4th century AD, includes accounts of the lives of Roman emperors from the 3rd to the 4th centuries AD. Here, three separate emperors, Alexander Severus, Aurelian, and Diocletian, are each described as encountering a Gaulish druidess, whose prophecies for their futures inevitably come true. These references have received little serious attention by scholars, as the Historia Augusta is now widely accepted to be highly unreliable, being either a work of satire or a wholesale fraud. But whilst the Historia Augusta is considered highly dubious from a historical perspective, it does open the door to an idea that's worth examining, that of female druids. Whilst there are no other clear accounts of druidesses amongst Greek and Roman authors, they do give examples of female religious officials amongst the societies of both Gaul and Britain in their writings. In addition to the black-clad women of Tacitus's account, who seem to have acted as cheerleaders for the British forces, we also have a curious example of Gallic priestesses related to us by Strabo. Citing Posidonius, he tells us of a group of women from the Samnitae tribe dedicated to the Greek god Dionysius, who dwelled in a temple on an island at the mouth of the Loire. According to Strabo, no men were allowed to set foot on the island, although the women would occasionally return to the mainland to seek sexual partners. He goes on to say that the women would choose one day a year to ritually re-roof their temple, and that the first woman to drop her load would be rent to pieces by the rest, with her body parts being carried around the temple to cries of Eva. This account is most likely hearsay. After all, Strabo was relying on information from Poseidonius, who as far as we know never travelled as far north as the mouth of the Loire. The variable nature of this account can also be seen in a similar story related to us by Pomponius Mela. In his version, there are nine of these women, who instead dwelled on an island between Gaul and Britain, where he claimed they acted as powerful oracles and remain perpetual virgins. We will return to this idea of female druids in our next episode. Before then, we come to our final Roman account, that of the 4th century AD poet Ausonius. In his Comerato Professorum, he makes a brief reference to a man who tells us he is a descendant of the druids of Baal and who served at the temple of the Gaulish god Belenus. We are further told of an old man by the name of Fabesius, who descended from the Druids of Brittany and who acted as a priest of Belenus. In this account, we see a sudden reversal in attitudes towards the Druids from that of the Roman authors of the 1st and the 2nd centuries AD. Instead of savages and purveyors of human sacrifice, here we see the Druids presented as acceptable ancestors. It seems by now that whatever threat they had once posed to Roman power had long passed, and in its place a degree of romance had begun to creep into their identity. So what can we make of these Roman and Greek accounts? Well, it is difficult to read them without detecting at least some element of propaganda. In addition to their description of the Druids as purveyors of human sacrifice, they provide an image of the peoples of Gaul and Britain that matches known Roman stereotypes of savagery. In the accounts of Diodorus and Strabo, the people of Gaul are pompous, fond of frets and bragging, and given to display in the heads of their defeated enemies. In the case of Britain, authors such as Caesar and Strabo are eager to describe them as ignorant of agriculture and proper clothing, claiming they dress themselves only in the skins of wild beasts. To Pliny, the Gauls are ruled by superstitions he is only too keen to mock, whilst Tacitus presents the Britons as being ruled over by women, a sign of weakness in the Roman world. 
What is also interesting is the way the tone of these accounts changes over time. In the writings of Caesar, the Druids and their practices are presented without much comment, and both Strabo and Diodorus limit most of their criticism to practices they claim have long since passed. By the time of Lucan, Pliny, and Suetonius, however, these accounts have become noticeably more hostile, with the latter two announcing their approval of the order's eradication. A similar vein of hostility can be found in Tacitus' account of the Druids in Britain, to whom he is eager to attribute all manner of barbarity. Then, after the apparent destruction of the Druids in both Gaul and Britain, these hostile accounts cease. By the 4th century, any threat they may have once posed to Roman authorities seems to have been destroyed entirely, so much so that respectable Roman citizens were happy to count them as honoured ancestors. In light of these attitudes, and the obvious benefit to the Romans of portraying these peoples in an unfavourable light, both historians and archaeologists alike have suggested that spurious elements may have made their way into these accounts. Unsurprisingly, the greatest attention has been focused on the claims of human sacrifice being conducted by the Druids, which it is argued may have been inserted to play to Roman notions of barbarity. Along this line of reasoning, authors such as Peter Beris Fidelis and Nora Chadwick have claimed that the more barbaric rituals ascribed to the Druids by Roman authors can be discounted entirely. In their minds, the Druids were an elite class of philosophers, who no pre-Roman account had definitively linked with human sacrifice. On the flip side, the historian Stuart Piggott found the image presented by the Romans to be realistic. Whilst perhaps the most sceptical of these authors, Ronald Hutton, notes that we have little way of telling what is and what is not true amongst these accounts. Finally, it should be noted that archaeologists such as Jane Webster Miranda Green and Barry Cunliffe have been more accepting of the image of druidic sacrifice provided by Roman authors, pointing to evidence for this activity that has been unearthed in both Gaul and Britain. Before we move on to examine these archaeological records ourselves, there are two further sources of information on religious practices amongst the Gauls that we should briefly explore. The first is the final group of ancient authors to reference the Druids in their writings. Known as the Alexandrian authors, after the city in which most of them dwelled, this group wrote between the 2nd and 4th centuries AD, and it is from their accounts that an altogether different picture of the Druids emerges. The first of these authors is one Dion Chrysostom, who wrote at the beginning of the 2nd century BC. In his account, the Druids are described simply as purveyors of wisdom amongst the Celts, acting as respected diviners and advisers to their kings. According to Dio, these kings were so ruled by their Druids that in truth they were the true rulers of their societies. The next account, that of the early Christian writer Hippolytus, returns to the association with Pythagoras, previously described by Diodorus. Here he claims that these teachings were taught to the Druids by a Thracian ex-slave of Pythagoras named Zamolsis, who came to the Gauls as a missionary after his master's death. This link with Pythagoras is reiterated by another Christian, St. Clement of Alexandria. In contrast to Hippolytus, however, he claims that Pythagorean principles were taught to the Greeks by the Gauls, and that this philosophy originated with them. He adds that the ancient Greeks also received many of their ideas from people they later considered barbarians, including the Assyrians and the Brahmin of India. Finally, we have the words of the last Roman historian of note, Ammianus Marcellinus, who included references to the Druids in his 4th century work, the Rerum Gestarum. Here they are again presented alongside the Bards and the Vates. Whilst the bards remain much the same as in previous accounts, the Vates are presented not as seers, but as investigators of the unknown and of the secret laws of nature. The Druids, now presented as being loftier in their intellect than the other groups, are again described as following the teachings of Pythagoras, along with studying all manner of obscure and profound subjects. The picture of the Druids we can garner from these accounts is one more in line with the early Greek accounts of the 2nd 
and 3rd centuries BC than any Roman account. Indeed, many of these authors seem to rely on sources dating from these eras. These include Diogenes Laetus, who provides the references to Sotion and Pseudo-Aristotle we discussed earlier in this episode, or Amnianus Marcellinus, who seems to be quoting from a garbled version of a text by a 1st century BC Greek author named Timagenes. What is also notable is that none of these authors attribute any form of human sacrifice to the Druids, nor do they provide much detail at all on their specific religious practices. Many of these accounts also come to us from a dramatically changed empire from that of two centuries prior. By the time many of these authors were active, the ancient Roman religion had itself been largely subsumed in favour of Christianity. In 313 AD, the Emperor Constantine had legalised Christianity throughout the empire, and over the next decades, successive emperors had slowly dismantled much of Rome's former religion. After the death of the Emperor Julian in 363 AD, all future emperors would be Christians, and in 380 AD, Emperor Theodosius would convene the Council of Nicaea, effectively making Nicene Christianity the state religion. Against this backdrop of a shift to Christianity, the Druids may suddenly have found themselves a more acceptable ancestor figure, acting as an early source of wisdom unconnected from the pagan religions of Greece and Rome. A final textual comparison can also be made between the people of Gaul in the 1st century BC and another contemporary group, the Galatians of northern Anatolia. These originally Gaelic people had invaded the Balkans during the first half of the 3rd century BC, before arriving in Macedonia and Greece around 281 BC. Whilst this invasion force would ultimately be turned back before reaching the Temple of Apollo at Delphi, a splinter group continued eastward. After crossing into Anatolia, this force spent time fighting as mercenaries the King Nicomedes of Bithynia, after which they were settled in an area known from then on as Galatia. Two descriptions of Galatian society have come down to us from Strabo and Pliny the Elder respectively, outlining society split into three separate tribes, each governed by four tetrarchs. These tetrarchs were in turn served by a judge and military commander, the former of which were entrusted with many of the duties attributed to the Druids by Roman authors. Curiously, however, no mention of the Druids can be found anywhere amongst either author's account, despite both authors providing descriptions of the Druids of Gaul elsewhere in the same works. It should be noted, however, that the picture of the Galatians presented by Strabo and Pliny is one over two centuries removed from their Celtic origins, and it is not unreasonable to assume that religious customs in this society may have evolved during nearly two centuries of residence in Anatolia. So with all of these various accounts considered, what can we make of the Druids? To most scholars, the answer is both everything and nothing. For all we know, the details of any of these accounts could be wholly true or wholly false, as we have no direct accounts by the peoples of Gaul or Britain with which to verify them. What we do have available, however, is the archaeological record of each of the countries where the Druids are claimed to have operated. Before we examine these, we should take some time to correct a few misconceptions about the sites at which the Druids supposedly worshipped. In popular culture, their enduring association has been with ritual sites such as Stonehenge, Avebury and Newgrange, along with the megalithic sites of Brittany and Auvergne in France. This association was first made by the pioneering archaeologists of the 17th century, and remained the dominant view among scholars as late as the second half of the 19th century. Even now these sites still hold importance for modern Druidic movements, and hundreds of their adherents regularly flock to these sites to celebrate the summer or winter solstices. Many of these sites are indeed astronomically aligned with these dates, and generally modern groups treat this time as a period between death and rebirth, when the sun abandons the earth and the darkest day of winter passes. <laughs> 
but whilst these dates were clearly of great ritual significance to the original builders of these sites, we now know that this tradition of megalithic building predates accounts of the Druids by millennia. In fact, most of these structures date from Neolithic times, with the earliest appearing during the first half of the 5th millennium BC. This pattern of monumental construction continued for much of the next three millennia, with many sites being gradually iterated on during this time. In Brittany, a dense collection of standing stones, known as the Karnak Stones, was erected between the 5th and the 4th millennium BC. At Stonehenge, the original ditch and banks were raised somewhere around the end of the 4th millennium BC, followed by progressive iterations of bluestone circles that continued to be raised over the next 1500 years. In addition to henges and standing stones, this period also saw the construction of large communal barrows and passage graves, along with complementary wooden structures such as the one found at Durrington Walls. Then, around the Middle Bronze Age, this pattern of construction began to cease. After 1500 BC, there is little evidence of continued rituals at either Stonehenge or Avebury, and outside of some scattered evidence of Roman activity, neither site seems to have received much attention in the centuries ahead. So we have no evidence that the Druids had anything to do with the megaliths of Northern Europe. Their supposed heyday came many centuries after these sites were abandoned, or in the case of the Neolithic tombs, sealed away. But is it possible that some elements of ritual behaviour from these times was passed down through the end of the Bronze Age, continuing on in the Iron Age practices of Gaul and Britain? Again, the answer is that this is unlikely. By all indications, religious practices in Northern Europe underwent a significant shift during the mid-2nd millennium BC. Ritual worship instead seems to have become focused on natural sites such as springs, rivers, marshland, and if we are to believe the accounts of classical authors, forest groves. The main form of worship became the deposition of votive offerings at these sites, with the resulting hordes often containing high prestige items such as bronze and iron weaponry. Prestige seems to have become centred around access to these precious items, only to shift in favour of ritual feasting and displays of excess. Burial practices also changed during this time. Cremation became the norm for much of the Bronze Age, only to be slowly supplanted by a complex patchwork of exhumation and inhumation. Unfortunately, we have little way to distinguish where in this process the Druids could have emerged. Many prior authors have attempted to equate their genesis with the emergence of the Latin culture of Central Europe from the 5th century BC onwards, or to one of their precursors, such as the Hallstatt or Urnfield cultures. Both have been suggested as potential origin points for the Proto-Celtic language and culture, and show strong continuity with the later Iron Age communities encountered by Greek and Roman authors. Thus, if the Druids were present in Gaul and Britain, the argument follows that they may have been present in areas where evidence of the Latin culture has been found, and may well have originated in one of its precursors. But before we can ever really answer the question of where the Druids originated, we would first have to be sure of their existence in their historically attested regions of Gaul and Britain. And to establish whether this is the case, we must look to the archaeological record and see what parallels can be made with the classical accounts of Druidic activity. Let's start by examining known Iron Age religious sites in northwestern Europe. In France, large-scale sanctuaries are known to have existed in several locations from the 4th century BC onwards, including the ones excavated at gournay sur aronde and ribemont sur ancre both of these sites began their lives as enclosures marked out by palisades and ditches, into which were placed large deposits of weaponry, tools, jewellery, and both human and animal bones. These ditches were complemented by groups of pits dug at their centres, alongside hollow altars and monumental entranceways. Similar enclosures are also known in neighbouring Switzerland, and a number of rectangular sites known as Verik Shanzen have been found throughout eastern France and Bavaria. 
In Britain, these ditched enclosures seem to have been less common, but examples of what may be similar centres have been found at Heath Row, Bisson Way in Norfolk, and at Hailing Island in Hampshire. Rectangular buildings tentatively identified as shrines have also been found within the interiors of Iron Age hill forts throughout southern England, including at Cadbury Castle, Danebury, and Maiden Castle. On first glance, the presence of these rectangular sites seems to suggest a common structure of religious observance throughout historical Gaul and Britain, each acting as enclosed ritual centres away from more domestic life. When we examine these centres individually, however, their differences become more obvious. For example, these sites often range significantly in scale, with some containing buildings rather than altars within their centres. In the case of Britain, sanctuaries associated with specific locations don't seem to have emerged until the very end of the Iron Age, and many of their buildings are circular rather than rectangular. At the Hill Fort Shrines, there is little evidence of any surrounding enclosure, nor is there much sign of separation between them and more domestic buildings. Further examination has also shown that some of these ditched enclosures may have had a more domestic role. For example, only limited evidence has been found of ritual behaviour at any of the Verik Shanzen enclosures, which lack the votive deposits of sites in northern France. Instead, it has been suggested that these sites may simply have acted as grain storage facilities, with no clear religious connotations. In addition to these sanctuaries, we also know of other classes of ritual sites in Iron Age Gaul. An example of this can be found in southern France where a ritual centre has been unearthed near modern Valau. This site, known as Roc Batus, dates between the 6th and the 3rd centuries BC and persisted until its destruction by the Romans during their conquest of southern Gaul in the 2nd century BC. This sanctuary, which consists of a large rectangular platform made of stone flags, contained a central portal or doorframe constructed from a series of decorated limestone pillars. These pillars were marked by recessed alcoves, in which human skulls would have been prominently displayed. A similar site associated with head veneration has also been found at nearby Entremont, where a number of stone heads have been unearthed. In Britain, we also know of ritual centres associated with the deposition of votive offerings that bear little resemblance to these enclosed sites. This includes centres such as Fiskerton, which show little evidence of having a temple complex attached, despite the presence of ritual platforms and vast deposits of bronze and iron items placed in the adjacent river. Similar deposits have been found in Anglesey, the supposed bastion of the Druids described by Tacitus. Here large amounts of metalwork have been unearthed at the edge of the lake of Flynn Kerrig back, including a crescent-shaped bronze plaque complete with lunar engravings. In addition to these water-based sites, we also know of the existence of wooded sanctuaries throughout both Britain and Gaul. Whilst these sites are archaeologically difficult to confirm, their presence is known through the existence of the Gaulish word Nemeton that can still be found as a place name throughout France and Britain. This name even appears in Strabo's account as Dry Nemeton, the name of the meeting place of the Supreme Council of the Galatians in Anatolia. So whilst there is some evidence for the sacred groves as described by Roman authors, there is little evidence for a uniform style of ritual site or worship across both Gaul and Britain. We do see a few common styles of worship, such as the widespread offerings of animal sacrifices and valuable metal items, but ultimately there is not enough evidence for us to say that the ceremonies conducted at these sites would have held a common form. In addition, it has recently been argued that the distinction between the domestic and the ritual may have been far less defined in both Gaul and Britain, and that the practices found at these defined ritual sites may not tell the full story of religious life in either of these sites. A good example of this is the deposition of animal and human remains in unused grain storage pits across southern England, an act that held clear ritual connotations. So what types of deities were being venerated at these centres? 
If we go by the evidence of later Roman inscriptions, there were perhaps hundreds of different gods and goddesses in Britain and Gaul, many of whom would be co-opted by the Romans after their respective conquests. A small number of these deities appear to have been worshipped widely across Northern Europe, including figures such as the Horned God, Sir Nunos, the God of Thunder, Tyrannus, or the God of Horses, Epona. Overwhelmingly, however, most gods appear to have been local ones, associated with specific tribes or ritual sites. Most of our information on these more local deities comes to us from later Roman inscriptions, in which many of them are mentioned only once. But the lack of a widespread presence for some of these gods should not be mistaken for a lack of popularity. Many local gods were likely far more popular in their core regions than the international gods. Examples of these include the cult of Sequana, whose ritual site was based at the mouth of the Seine in Burgundy, or the British gods Sullis and Nodent, both of whom had elaborate sites devoted to them at Bath and Lydney Park respectively. There are even some Celtic gods who would later be incorporated wholesale into the Roman pantheon, including the aforementioned Sequana and Epona, the latter of whom would become part of the imperial cult as Epona Augusta, the patron god of cavalry. However, these gods are in a distinct minority, and the majority of Celtic deities seem to have been simply equated to an existing member of the Roman pantheon. For example, the gods Isis and Teutates, who were widely worshipped throughout Gaul and Britain, would be equated with Mercury and Mars respectively, while Sullis would later be identified with Minerva, the Roman god of wisdom and medicine. For a long time, this synchronization was argued to be a simple form of integration by the new authorities, allowing the locals to continue their long-standing religious practices under an acceptable veneer of Roman worship. Under this school of thought, it was argued that the nature of the Iron Age gods and goddesses was preserved largely intact throughout the Roman period. In more recent decades, however, the relevance of the deities outlined in Roman inscriptions to the original gods of these societies has come under question. Many archaeologists, including Anne Ross and Miranda Green, have argued that the idea that local gods persisted in their same form under new Roman titles may well be overly simplistic. Instead, they theorise that the Romans would have reinterpreted and adapted these gods to suit their own needs and that this adaptation may well have been an integral part of Romanizing the various peoples held under their sway. So ultimately there is little sign of a unified pantheon amongst the people of Gaul and Britain, as described by Caesar. But can we say the same about the priests associated with these sites? Well luckily for us, a small number of inscriptions have been found throughout Gaul that appear to include native religious titles. From our perspective, the most interesting element of these inscriptions is their complete lack of mention of the Druids. Instead, we see titles such as Vergebret, Antistas, and Gutueta appearing alongside shrines and votive deposits. The first of these was found inscribed on a ruined pot at a Gallo Roman shrine in Argentomagus, and it is the same title as that accorded to the Gaulish leader Diviciatus by Caesar. This inscription was found in tribal territory belonging to the Bitteriges, a neighbouring tribe of Diversiatus's Adui. This inscription has also been interpreted by Miranda Green as indicating the Vergebret's participation in a votive ceremony at this site. If true, this may again indicate a degree of overlap between the nobility and the religious classes of Gaul a perception reinforced by Cicero's identification of Diviciatus as a druid. Interestingly, this deposit also dates from the reign of Emperor Tiberius, a time when Pliny claims druidic practices were outlawed. These inscriptions provide little evidence for a single priesthood, and stand at odds with the account of Caesar, who describes a unified priesthood throughout Gaul. To explain this contradiction, we have two clear possibilities. Either the picture Caesar presents is an oversimplification born of ignorance, or it is simply a false one, constructed for the benefit of his Roman audience. <laughs>
If so, then many of his fellow authors seem to have been happy to turn a blind eye. And indeed, few of them make mention of the specific gods that the people of Gaul or Britain would have worshipped. There is one Roman author, however, whose works accurately present known deities of Iron Age Gaul and Britain. Ironically, it is one inspired by Caesar, that of the poet Lucan. In his brief mention of the Druids found within his epic poem, the Pharsalia, he lists the name of three deities, Teutates, Isis, and Tyrannus. All three of these are known to have been worshipped at a range of sites throughout Northern Europe. Inscriptions to Teutates have been found throughout Britain and Gaul, mostly in the form of Romano-British finger rings. Isis is similarly known from two Gaulish inscriptions, in which he is depicted as a male figure pruning a tree. The last, Tyrannus, is well attested to throughout Northern Europe as the god of thunder, where he is depicted in similar fashion to the Roman god Jupiter, though with the frequent addition of a wheel. This authentic presentation of Celtic names by Lucan thus adds a degree of weight to his account, and many later writers have attempted to use these descriptions and the commentaries of later authors to assign specific methods of human sacrifice to each of these deities. According to the 10th century commenter Bernencia, sacrifices to Teutates were performed by drowning the victims in a vat of unknown liquid, whilst those to Isis were performed by hanging. Finally, worship towards Tyrannus was shown by the ritual burning of human victims, a practice some scholars have attempted to equate with the wicker men described by Caesar. However, it should be noted that neither ritual drowning or hanging are mentioned in any of these classical accounts, and that the commentaries these arguments are based on are separated from the original account by nearly a millennium. In addition to his documenting of known Celtic deities, there is also another detail found in Lucan's account that has piqued the interest of archaeologists. In the Pharsalia, he describes a sacred grove near the Greek town of Massalotes, wherein the gods were supposedly venerated in the form of wooden figures. As we detailed before, the existence of these groves is difficult to track archaeologically, but wooden figurines dating from this period have been found throughout the Celtic world. For pre-Roman examples, we can point to figures unearthed in the British Isles, including those found at Argyll, Scotland, and further south at King Stainton in Devon. In East Yorkshire, five wooden figurines have also been unearthed near the village of Roos, whilst across the sea in Ireland, a similar figure has been discovered at Ralaghan in County Cavan. With the exception of the Ralaghan figurine, which may date from the Late Bronze Age, these figures date from between the 6th and the 4th centuries BC, and are often suggested to represent cult images of gods or goddesses. Wooden figures dating from the early Roman period have also been unearthed at the ritual centre of Chamaliers, as well as at the source of the Seine, the ritual centre of the god Sequana. So could these figures have been a symbol of Druidic worship? Whilst we cannot be certain of a Druidic link, it seems likely that some of these figures would have carried ritual connotations. For example, archaeologists have interpreted the site of the wooden figure found at Argyll to be a ruined shrine or enclosure. Other figures have also been suggested to have acted as boundary markers, carved in the image of local gods in order to protect tribal borders. These statues could also represent priests associated with rituals conducted at these sites, or be images of local rulers. This seems likely in the case of a bronze figure unearthed at Waz in France. This figure is crafted in the image of a Gaelic warrior, wearing a decorative torque, armour and shield, and it has been suggested by archaeologist Miranda Green that it could represent either a warrior deity or a local chieftain. Alternatively, some of these figures may have been intended to depict the worshippers themselves. Evidence of this can be found amongst the Roman era figurines found at Chamaliers and at the cult centre of Sequana, many of which appear to carry the afflictions of pilgrims who may have sought healing at these sites. As for the earlier Iron Age figures, for all we know, they could simply have acted as decorations or even toys. There is also little unified iconography to be found amongst these figures, 
which range from featureless wooden effigies to complicated bronze figurines. Finally, it should be kept in mind that Lucan only mentioned these figures when discussing the grove encountered outside Massalotis, and that as a result it is unlikely to preserve native Gaulish ritual behaviours. So aside from a handful of facts, such as the name of free gods, the presence of wooded sanctuaries, and the existence of ritual deposits, there seems to be a little in common between the archaeological record and the accounts of Roman authors. Certainly the ubiquitous priesthood of Caesar, Strabo, and Diodorus seems to be absent from any known inscriptions, as does the title of Druid itself. But what about the ceremonial items found away from these centres, unearthed at burials or in isolated places like bogland or rivers? Well, it is here that the most compelling evidence for a form of specialist priesthood in Britain has been found. It takes the form of two distinct classes of Iron Age object. The first of these consists of several unusual pieces of headgear that have been unearthed in cist burials in graves throughout southern England and Wales. The most widely known of these headdresses, or perhaps helmets, was unearthed in 1988 at Deal in Kent, inside a male burial site dating from between the 3rd and the 2nd centuries BC. This helmet, which was worn on the man's head, consisted of a narrow brim with two bands that formed a cross over the top of the head. Similar headgear has been reported in finds from Cambridgeshire and Glamorgan, along with possible finds from Clwyd and Middlesex. Comparisons have also been made between these items and headdresses known to have been worn by British priests during the Roman period. However, no known example of these headdresses has been found in other areas where the Druids are claimed to have been active, such as in Gaul or Ireland. Moving beyond these headdresses, the second class of items we can point to are a set of bronze spoons or scoops that have been found in areas of Britain and Ireland, with a solitary pair also being unearthed in eastern France. Only around 15 of these items are known to exist, with most of them being found in pairs. Almost all of these spoons seem to have been deliberately deposited within graves or hoards, and their exact age remains uncertain. Going by their decoration styles, these spoons may range in date from the 5th century BC to the 2nd century BC, and seem to have no Roman associations. These spoons take the form of small, shallow bowls, which are large enough to sit comfortably within an adult's hand. In almost all examples, one of these spoons contains a small, offset hole, whilst the other is usually marked by an incised cross. These features have led archaeologists to theorise that these spoons held a divinatory role associated with the druids, wherein liquid would be poured into the bowl of the perforated spoon, allowing it to run through the hole and pull in the second spoon held below. However, this theory now seems more uncertain. For example, the bowls of these spoons are too shallow to hold much liquid, and it has been demonstrated that the holes are too small for water to flow through them. This doesn't rule out a different liquid, however, or that a powdered or granulated substance could have been used instead. These finds are certainly significant, and may well indicate a greater degree of uniformity in ritual practices amongst the peoples of Britain than seen at established ritual sites. But again, we have no direct evidence of druidic involvement, and the most notable items described by a classical writer, the golden sickle and serpent eggs of Pliny, remain absent. Perhaps the closest item we have to these descriptions of druidic practices comes from a single burial unearthed near Stanway, dating from around 50 AD. This burial, which comes from a graveyard of what are likely early Roman client kings, contains a set of instruments similar to known Greco-Roman surgical tools. What has excited more interest, however, is the inclusion in the grave of an otherwise unique set of rods, which archaeologists have theorised may have been used as a form of divinatory tool. In addition to these tools, this individual was also buried with a cloak decorated with brooches, an intact board game, and a tea strainer containing residue of the herb Artemisia. Due to the inclusion of these items, this burial has been routinely described as the doctor's grave by archaeologists, 
but to the general public, the individual it contains is better known by another title, the Druid of Colchester. So was this individual a druid? The answer is that it is certainly a possibility. After all, divinatory and herbal knowledge were widely attributed to the druids by ancient authors, and there is ample evidence that both were practiced by the individual placed within this grave. However, the picture is complicated by known crossover between Iron Age magical practices and those of early medicine. Outside of the rods, there is little evidence that this individual was a member of any organised priesthood, and indeed much of their kit is consistent with well-known Roman medical practices. As a result, the most we can say is that this person was certainly a member of the public elite, acting either as a doctor, religious official, or perhaps even both. In addition to these spoons, headdresses, and divinatory rods, we have one last item to consider, one that is by far the most frequently associated with the druids. It consists of the fragmentary remains of a large bronze tablet that was unearthed in the late 19th century in the French commune of Coligny. Engraved on this tablet was an elaborate calendar outlining both the solar year and lunar months, along with a system of notations listing both auspicious and inauspicious dates. This calendar dates from between the 1st and the 2nd centuries AD, and was written using the Latin alphabet, though the language it was composed in is Gaulish. Whilst only a small part of this calendar has survived, it contains a full five-year cycle, and this repetition allows us to reconstruct it with some confidence. By all indications, the calendar outlined in this tablet may be the original Celtic lunisolar calendar. Support for this comes from its counting of time not by days, but by nights, practice of the Gauls claimed by both Caesar and Pliny. This five-year calendar also bears some resemblance to the five-year cycle of sacrifices amongst the Gauls outlined by Diodorus, on which occasions he claims captives would have been first impaled and then burned alongside offerings of summer fruits in honour of the gods. Attempts have also been made to link this calendar with the 30-year lunar cycle of the Druids outlined in Pliny's account, although the presence of large numbers of notations and abbreviations make the exact length of any longer cycle open to individual interpretation. So did the Druids create this calendar? The answer might very well be yes, given that it was constructed during a period when Roman authors were still reporting the presence of Druids in Gaul and that it bears a passing similarity to other elements of their accounts. However, it could have just as easily been drawn up by Romanized officials who retained a knowledge of local customs. Indeed, similar intercalary systems are known to have existed amongst the ancient Greeks, and the Caligny calendar may well have been influenced by these systems through trade links with the Massalias to the south. Even so, this hasn't stopped historians and archaeologists alike from citing this calendar as a piece of druidic handiwork, many of whom argue that only the druids would have had the advanced lunar and solar knowledge required for its crafting. As to whether it was observed throughout Gaul and Britain, however, we cannot be sure. So far only one other example has been found, at a Roman-era shrine in a nearby village of the Lards de Heria. Sadly, this calendar is even more fragmentary, consisting as it does of only eight small fragments. So it seems we again have no certain evidence of druidic involvement with these items, with the possible exception of the Coligny calendar and the items found in the doctor's grave. But there is one final element of the archaeological record that bears examining in relation to the druids. It concerns a practice that Roman authors were more than happy to attribute to the peoples of both Britain and Gaul that of ritual human sacrifice. Let's start with potential evidence for this activity in ritual centres in Gaul. At sites such as Ribemont sur Ancre and Roquepertus, we can find ample evidence for the ritual display of body parts. We previously detailed the ceremonial stone alcoves found at Roquepertus, alcoves that are designed for the display of human skulls. 
At Ribemont, however, the displays are far more ghoulish, consisting of hundreds of human bodies found both inside and outside of its central enclosure. Many of these bodies were found to be incomplete or damaged, and some of their bones seemed to have been used in the construction of two rectangular ossuaries built in the corners of the enclosure. A mass grave was also unearthed outside its ditch, containing the bodies of over 100 male skeletons, each of which seemed to have been ritually decapitated. A similar display of bodies has been found at the cult site of Montmartin, and evidence of ritual destruction of human remains has also been unearthed at gournay sur aron and at the site of Mormont in western Switzerland. There is significant uncertainty over what exactly these mass displays of body parts represent. Most scholars agree that the bodies found at Rivermont are the victims of a single large Iron Age battle, which the shrine may originally have been built to commemorate. Some of the heads displayed at Rock Pertus simply seem to have come from the bodies of men slain in battle, as shown by a piece of javelin found still embedded in one of the skulls. As a result, earlier scholars hypothesized that one of the functions of these sites was to ensure the ritual humiliation of their fallen opponents, where their bodies would be displayed as trophies or otherwise destroyed. Whilst this may well be true of the skulls displayed at Rock Pertus, it is now thought that the headless warriors found in the mass grave outside the Ribemont enclosure are the foes of the sanctuary's builders, given their decapitation and careless burial. By comparison, the several hundred bodies found within the enclosure seem to have been subjected to a complicated ritual treatment. First, they seem to have been displayed in the open air, where they were allowed to decay until only the bones and ligaments remained. Some of these bones were then used to construct the ossuaries, whilst others were carefully destroyed by being crushed and then cremated. The purpose of these destructions is unknown. Perhaps it simply marked an unusual form of ritual treatment for the locals' departed comrades, the most prestigious of whom had their bones selected for inclusion amongst the ossuaries. Other authors have taken the opportunity to suggest that these are not fallen warriors at all, but the bodies are sacrificial victims. Whilst the evidence for this at Rivermont and other sites in northern Gaul remains unclear, this may well be true of the remains found at Mormont, where bones have been unearthed, carrying clear signs of butchery. So there may well be some slim evidence for human sacrifice in parts of Iron Age Gaul. But can we say the same for Across the Channel? Well, let us start by examining the key piece of evidence that many authors cite as proof of ritual druidic sacrifice in Britain. It consists of the body of a 25-year-old man, an earth from a bog in Lindau in Cheshire, dating from somewhere between the 1st and the 2nd centuries AD. Due to the oxygen-free conditions of his environment, large portions of his torso remained well-preserved, enough so that we can reconstruct a picture of how he would have lived and died. As best we can tell, Lindo Man seems to have been a member of the social elite. By all signs his body was well nourished, bearing few signs of hard physical labour. According to pathologist Ian West, who performed the initial forensic analysis at London Hospital, he was subjected to a freefall death. First, he was stunned by two blows to the head, after which he was garroted by a cord made of animal sinew, which fractured his neck. Finally, his throat was cut. Any one of these wounds could have been fatal by themselves, suggesting a level of theatricality to his dispatch consistent with ritual sacrifice. The contents of the man's stomach have also been offered as evidence for druidic involvement, consisting of a cake made from barley that had been laced with mistletoe pollen. Even his one item of clothing has been largely interpreted in a ritual context, consisting of a fox fur band worn around his upper arm. So in Lindo Man, we likely have an example of a ritual killing, if not an outright human sacrifice. Perhaps his body was deposited in the bog after death in order to mark out a tribal boundary, or to act as an offering to an unknown deity. The discovery of mistletoe residue within his last meal 
has also invited comparisons to the writings of Pliny, who speaks of the special reverence the Druids held for mistletoe grown on oak trees. It is on further examination, however, that this picture becomes less clear. Firstly, it seems that not every forensic expert to have examined the body agrees with the hypothesis of a threefold death. Robert Connolly, a lecturer in physical anthropology at the University of Liverpool, has suggested that many of these wounds were in fact inflicted post-mortem, perhaps as a result of the peat-cutting operations that led to Lindo Mann's discovery. Instead, he points to the initial blows to the head as being the only pre-mortem wounds, and claims that the ligature found alongside the man's neck may in fact have been ornamental rather than a murder weapon. Moreover, it is uncertain that the mistletoe pollen found within the man's stomach was intentionally added to his meal. Ultimately, only four grams were found to be present, an amount well within the limits of accidental contamination. This isn't to say that the initial forensic examination of Lindoman was wrong, and that Connolly is right, simply that the jury is still out as to whether Lindoman was a human sacrifice. Either way, he was certainly a prestigious individual, whose execution and deposition in the bog had a degree of ritual overtones. Where we can be more certain of human sacrifice in Britain, however, is in the bodies that have been unearthed within the interiors of hill forts throughout southern England. These bodies are generally found in ditches or disused grain storage pits, with most of them being found complete, often in positions suggesting they were carefully deposited in the graves after death. In a few examples, however, such as at Wandbury Ring and Danebury, bodies have been found that clearly underwent some form of ritual mutilation. At Wandlebury, the remains of a partially dismembered child have been found, whilst at Danebury, the finds are even more macabre. Here a pit containing some 25 mutilated bodies has been unearthed, mostly consisting of young males who seem to have been bound prior to their deaths. Many of these bodies show signs of having had their legs crudely hacked off, and it is unknown whether this happened before or after their deaths. According to the lead excavator of this site, Barry Cunliffe, these bodies appear not to have been deposited over a period of years, suggesting that either the pit remained open for extended periods, or was repeatedly uncovered so that new bodies could be interred. We can never be sure just how many of these remains are a consequence of human sacrifice. Some may simply have been criminals, executed in a fashion that only resembles ritual sacrifice. But even if we were to assume that most of these cases were indeed human sacrifices, then the sites at which they occur are in a distinct minority compared to those where there is no such evidence of this activity. Perhaps the most we can say is that while peoples in parts of both Gaul and Britain are likely to have utilised human sacrifice as part of their rituals, there is little evidence of it forming a common part of the religious systems of these places. So in general terms, what can we glean from this archaeological record? Well, perhaps the most obvious factor is that while there is ample evidence for complex ritual behaviours amongst the Iron Age peoples of Gaul and Britain, there is little evidence for any unified belief structure, nor is there any evidence for the existence of an international priesthood. Whilst inscriptions mentioning religious officials have been found, they present a variety of different religious titles, and no title resembling that of Druid has yet been found. Indeed, it seems there is little evidence for a distinction between ritual and mundane life in either of the societies where the Druids were supposedly present, and it is more likely that the elites of these Iron Age societies held some form of dual role, acting both as nobility and as priests depending on the occasion. This idea may perhaps explain the contradictions in Caesar and Cicero's accounts over the role of Diviciatus, who was presented as both a druid and as a military leader. The specific gods worshipped by these societies also seem to have varied dramatically, 
a picture complicated by their later co-option by the Romans. Finally, despite evidence of human sacrifices and display of body parts in some areas of both Gaul and Britain, it remains unlikely that human sacrifice was a common element of religious practices in either society. So if there is little sign amongst the archaeological record for the Druids in either Gaul or Britain, how might classical authors have constructed such a picture? Well, we have to remember that few of these authors had first-hand experience with any of these societies, and that their accounts are frequently coloured by their Greco-Roman backgrounds. Faced with an unfamiliar set of ritual beliefs, they may well have sought to impose ideas of religious organisations seen in their own societies onto these cultures, even inventing them wholesale if necessary. As a result, what was in fact a patchwork of different ritual practices may well have been simplified down to a common religious class, one that the Roman readers of these authors would have found easier to digest. Reports of human sacrifice, which may well have occurred in some parts of Gaul and Britain, were in turn added to the common package of the Druids, the prevention of which these authors would have used to justify their conquests. Later, with native religious practices largely pacified, all manner of hearsay began to be added to their image, as shown by the practices ascribed to the Druids by both Pliny and Lucan. Even so, we cannot dismiss the existence of the Druids entirely, if only because of the presence of similar words for seer or wise one in other Indo-European languages. Perhaps the word Druidite may simply have served as a generic word for priest or wise one amongst the peoples of these regions, that later came to be applied uncritically by Greek and then Roman authors to any and all religious officials they encountered. This might well explain the widespread contradictions between their accounts, which could each have been attempting to push many different religious customs into a common mould. Alas, all of this is conjecture, as it seems are so many things when it comes to the Druids. But whilst we have come to the end of our examination of the Druids of ancient Gaul and Britain, there is another place where the Druids are claimed to have survived long after their brethren had vanished. It is here, across the Irish Sea, that the Druids would supposedly remain the religious elite of their society for another 400 years, deferred to even by the very kings that they supposedly served. We'll examine these Irish Druids and more next time.